We made this. Engage. I'm Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Federation Starship Enterprise. Michael Burnham, pleased to meet you. What we leave behind is not as important as how we've lived. We will continue exploring, discovering new worlds, new civilizations. That is the United Federation of Planets. That is Starfleet. Make it so. Hello and welcome back to Make It So, a dedicated podcast to Star Trek Picard and the wider Star Trek universe. I am your host, Luke Winch, and Make It So is part of the We Made This podcast network. Now, we may have, under normal circumstances, been preparing for the imminent arrival of Season 2 of Star Trek Picard. But as we all know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic still looms over us. And this has, of course, put filming back by quite a substantial amount uh, with Star Trek Picard. I did see a couple of weeks ago, Jerry Ryan tweeted that production was hoping to start on February 1st. Uh, We shall have to see, of course, because these things are changing day by day at the minute. In the meantime, we at Make It So... Kurt and I have some special supplementary episodes to give you over the coming months. We are going to look in depth at the Borg. Uh, This will be in the universe of Starship Picard, but also the wider franchise as well. I'm also going to look at the Romulans as well over the larger Star Trek franchise. Uh, And we'll we'll probably get some more to you as well. And hopefully some news uh, as and when production begins. But to kick us off with these special supplementary episodes i am absolutely delighted to welcome to the podcast uh, the author of the new starship picard tie-in novel the dark veil he is bafta nominated he's a new york times and sunday times best-selling author it is the one and only james swallow welcome to the podcast oh it's great to be here thanks for inviting me on no worries no worries um how you doing how you doing with all the with all this third lockdown and stuff oh crazy hey you know um it's funny being an author a full-time writer living at home working from home is pretty much kind of par for the course for me so when uh lockdown first started i was like oh hey now everybody else is going to know what it's like to be an author you know sitting in front of your computer every day and barely leaving the house and becoming almost a shut-in but uh the, the kind of the the fun of it is the novelty's worn off a bit now i think i think people have all kind of realized that you know we're all getting a little bit sick of it. We would like to get a little bit of freedom. And as the as the nights are getting shorter and the days are getting brighter, you know, I think we're all kind of champing at the bit to get back to to the way things were. Luckily for me, having had some experience with sort of like lockdown life, um, with my wife was sort of like coming uh, coming home to sort of do work from home stuff. So I had a, I had some hints and tips that I could give to her about how to kind of schedule your day and kind of keep yourself sane. But I think we're we all feel like we're pretty much done with this now, right? uh yeah definitely i think january and february are, are usually quite hard months to kind of dredge through anyway and you know with this added added thing it just it's just like oh come on now <laughs> yeah i mean uh, one good thing is that at least we've had plenty of stuff to entertain us right i mean uh and certainly uh this year 2021 is going to be an awesome year to be a trek fan right because there's so much new stuff coming out so at the very least we've got kind of um we can kind of self-medicate with Star Trek and, and entertainment just to keep us keep us sane. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, we're here today to talk about your your new book, uh, The Dark Veil, which is, of course, a tie-in novel to the Star Trek Picard. I think before we go on, there there may be, you know, depending on how the conversation goes, but we may we may get into a few spoilers from this point onwards, just to just to warn the. Uh, uh, the listeners but uh we'll, we'll try and stay off the really big ones if, if we if we can okay so james i'm sure many of our listeners will probably know your other star trek work but for anyone who doesn't tell us a little bit about your background and uh and about your writing journey and, and where it all began really so my star trek nerd origin story okay uh, that's always that's always a fun one to tell well <laughs> i mean I, I so i'm a i'm a kind of classic trek fan um my kind of first fandom was star trek i got into it in the eighties when the show was being repeated on BBC two. So that was, that was my first sort of um, entry into it was watching TOS. And I became a huge fan of that. 
uh, and as I as I got older, I, you know, I always wanted to be a writer, and so I was doing fan writing and stuff, and I was working with fan clubs and writing fanzines and that kind of thing, kind of indulging my sort of love of Star Trek and science fiction through that. That ended up growing into me working as a professional entertainment journalist. And I worked for a lot of um, sci-fi magazines as well there. So magazines like Starlog and SFX and that kind of thing. One of the publications I worked for was the official Star Trek monthly magazine as well, writing features for that and uh, the Star Trek fact files, if you know those. And through working on those, I managed to meet and uh, interview a lot of the people who worked on Star Trek, the, the TV shows. And, uh, getting friendly with them and, and learning more about becoming a writer as I was kind of like leveling up as a writer. I got to the point where I pitched uh, a couple of story ideas to the TV show, Star Trek Voyager, and I was lucky enough to sell. And I sold these two story premises, which got actually made into episodes. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the episode one, which is uh, seven of nine on the ship by herself as they travel through a radioactive nebula. Mm -hmm. And the other story was called Memorial, which is where they discover a war memorial that is broadcasting memories of a, of a terrible atrocity and the, the characters on the ship start reliving these, these terrible events. That was right at the beginning of my writing career. My first two sort of professional, professionally paid uh, jobs uh, working on Star Trek was kind of like, you know, that was like winning the lottery for me as a, as a young Trek fan. Uh, and off the back of that, I uh, started a, a writing career, writing uh, for science fiction novels, tie-in novels. And of course, that meant I wanted to try my hand at writing Star Trek tie-in fiction as well. So I did uh, some short stories and uh, basically kind of upgraded to writing novels. And then pretty much since then, every couple of years or so, uh, I've been coming back to the Star Trek universe and writing a Star Trek story. As you say, my most recent release, just come out earlier this month, is The Dark Veil, vale, which is a Star Trek Picard novel. But it largely features uh, Will Riker and Deanna Troy, tying into some of the storyline that we saw in uh, the first season of Star Trek Picard. And also uh, connecting with their their tenure on the USS Titan, which is uh, mentioned at the end of Star Trek Nemesis. Yeah, I um I watched Nepenthe uh, again this afternoon because I hadn't watched the the entire series, and and it was interesting, kind of you filling in the gaps about Thad, their 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 younger son, um, who of course has passed away by the time we get to Star Trek Picard, and and you kind of write about the period kind of before his death i mean was was that something that that attracted you you know uh writing about this this small family unit as well as the larger picture of of, of star trek picard yeah pretty much i mean when when the directive originally came down i was working with kirsten Bayer, who um was a writer on the star trek voyager novel series and as and then it's kind of like um upgraded herself to working on the show so now she's a, a writer and producer on star trek discovery uh, and Star Trek Picard. And because Kirsten uh, had a, a novelist sort of background, she knew that there was an opportunity to tie the novels much more closely to the sort of newer generation of Star Trek shows than we had previously. We did that on uh, Discovery, so that all of the Discovery novels are all kind of showing you aspects of characters on that show, uh, you know, looking into their backstory and telling you a little bit about their past and kind of growing the, the mythology of that narrative. And we wanted to do the same thing with Star Trek Picard. We did that with the first book in the Picard series, which was uh, my colleague Una McCormack's novel, The Last Best Hope, which talks a lot about Picard's journey to, to the point where he resigns, which we sort of like, we see a little bit in flashback, but she really fleshes that out. And some of the stuff we had kind of on the table was we were talking about other characters that had appeared in season one of Picard. And we were saying, well, what stories can we tell about them? And we, initially we looked at doing some stuff about Seven of Nine, talking about her journey from the end of Voyager to the where we see her in uh, in uh, Star to Sea Rag, and then we talked about um, Worf being promoted to captain of the Enterprise. Is like you know what was his story? What's been going on with him after Picard resigned? But the story that kind of really appealed to me because frankly they're my favorite couple in Star Trek was the was the Riker Troy storyline. They've always been my favorite characters uh, in in TNG, and I kept thinking to myself, I, I've I want to go and tell this story. I'd already told a few stories with Picard uh, with um, with Riker on the the USS Titan in the in the Titan literary novels that we've done but with the continuity kind of being reset a little bit for the for the TV show this was an opportunity to sort of revisit that but do it in a new way in the new continuity and take on this idea about the the family life that we see hinted at in the TV show but we never really see on screen so creating a story around that dynamic around the sort of like the mother father son dynamic and also building out a larger sort of action adventure story that's you know a pure star trek story to me that was uh, a really fun challenge when i just grabbed on with both hands 
Yeah. I mean, so for our listeners who maybe aren't aware that, that you have a new book out or, or, or they want to know what it's about, what's, what's, what's the blurb, what's the narrative of the story? I can give you the blurb if you like. The, yeah. um, the Alpha Quadrant is mired in crisis. Within the United Federation of Planets, a terrorist strike on the shipyards of Mars has led to the shutdown of all relief efforts for millions of Romulans facing certain doom from an impending supernova. But when the USS Titan is drawn into a catastrophic incident on the Romulan Federation border, Captain William Riker, his family and his crew find themselves caught between the shocking secrets of an enigmatic alien species and the deadly agenda of a ruthless Tau Shiar operative. Forced into a wary alliance with a Romulan starship commander, Riker and the Titan crew must uncover the truth and stop a devastating attack, but one wrong move could plunge the entire sector into open conflict. Excellent. I, I, I have read the book. Uh, I finished it yesterday and I really, really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Um, and I, I like how it takes it takes place over a, a, sh- a very short period of time, say, compared to Una's book, which, which takes over three or four years. And this one takes place over, over a few days. Um, but were there any particular kind of themes or topics that, that you wanted to cover or you were asked to incorporate uh, into this book that, that kind of linked to the wider world of Star Trek Picard? Well, pretty much with the, the background of Thad is, uh, is I was asked to, you know, make sure that he was a focal character in the story to give him agency in the narrative so we could actually learn a little bit about him. Because, of course, all we see of, of Thad in the TV series is we kind of see the echoes of who he was. And the, 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 you see the impact he's had on other people's lives, but you never really see him. So this was an opportunity to sort of kind of put some meat on the bones of that character. And I was very lucky that uh, Michael Shabon, who's one of the, the producers and writers on the show, had written all this backstory about who Thad was and, uh, you know, the, the mythical planet Vardani that he had created. Uh, and he gave me all that material to draw from so I could fold some of that back into the story and, you know, cross connect these elements that maybe might have just kind of been left on the cutting room floor. So that was the sort of primary focus, I think, um, in that element of the story. I mean, I was interested. How do you find the voice of a, a of a six year old boy and 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 work that into the narrative and 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 keep him this this very um, innocent but very uh, intellectual young boy? Yeah, it's difficult with with writing young characters because you know you don't want to be patronizing and you don't want to create like a stereotype mm. sort of super bright precocious child. I my, what was my guiding light was trying to make Thad feel true and make him feel honest. So what I did is I drew from life. Is uh, I looked at uh, all my family and friends and, and young uh, you know nieces and nephews that I had, and I thought, well, how how did they seem to me, and and how how do they behave? And so I just tried to base Thad's character on them as much as I possibly could, while also kind of giving him uh, a degree of agency in the story, because obviously I didn't want him just kind of sitting on the sidelines or just getting into trouble. I wanted him to be an active part of the narrative. Mm. Uh, and, and that was a lot of fun to write, to to come up with this, you know, this this smart, precocious little kid. But at the end of the day, he is just still, you know, a six-year-old boy. Um, and it was it was sort of fun to grasp that. Yeah. And of course, I mean, when you're writing a tie-in novel, is there a certain criteria that, you know, there's obviously some parameters that you're given, but are you given any free reign in, 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 in the story as well? Well, it varies. I mean, sometimes working on a Star Trek tie-in, uh, my editor will say to me, what would you like to write? And I'll be given the equivalent of like, you know, a blank sheet of paper. I say, well, I'd like to write a DS9 novel. Oh, that sounds like a great idea. And I'd like to write something with the Tholians in it. Yeah, go ahead. You know, mm-hmm. and, and I'll, I'll get an opportunity to to just come up with whatever I like. S- some other times, like for example, with um, with the Dark Vale, is I was given a couple of directives and they said, well, we want that to be in it. We want it to be a Riker and Troy story. But other than that, you can do whatever you like. So um, I came up with the the narrative about the the Jazari, this alien species who are like you know leaving the galaxy, and the the Titan is uh, sort of escorting them out, and the idea of this uh, Romulan starship that that comes to their aid, uh, and a Romulan starship captain with a kind of crew that is almost like a mirror image of Riker's crew on board the USS Titan, and they both find themselves sort of dealing with this problem that's in front of them and, and they're trying to find a way through it and navigate past their, their prejudices and also kind of do the right thing so they can, they can save the day, which to me feels like, you know, very much a, a kind of true Star Trek story. So um, with, with this story, it, it was a bit of a mix, some directive, but mostly I was given a free hand. Yeah. And with the, your two Romulan main characters, they're, they're, they're from very different, a, a huge spectrum 
uh, between these two these two Romulans. And, and I suppose they represent the extremes of the Romulan Empire, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to show um, a, a Romulan character who is just obsessed with the uh, the the directives that they got i have to be careful because i'm kind of tiptoeing around the spoilers in the story so i can't say i can't be too you know too open about what what that is but a a character here who is is basically someone who has gone through this experience and been changed by it to the point that they've become this kind of zealous believer and they're willing to do anything and cross any line in order to do what they think is right which i think is an interesting sort of persona to explore and then on the other hand we have the the idea of the the honourable Romulan, which we've seen before, if we go back to the very first appearance of the Romulans in Star Trek in Balance of Terror, mm. when you think of the commander there and that the Mark Leonard's character, and there is a direct lineage. You know, I even kind of hint at the fact that the Romulan commander in this story is related to that Romulan. So the idea is that there are you know there are there are good Romulans as, uh, and there are bad Romulans. You know, we often see in Star Trek these kind of ideas of these sort of monolithic cultures is where you know, like every Klingon is a warrior. And it's like, well, every Klingon can't be a warrior. There must be Klingon accountants, right? There must be Klingon plumbers, right? Like, they've got to have people who aren't all soldiers. And I think it's the same with the Romulans. Is the, the idea of the Romulans is that they're these kind of sneaky, underhanded people and that they're always stabbing each other in the back and they're all full of secrets. And maybe some of that is true, but that's just too simplistic a way to think of them is there's a lot more depth and there's a lot more nuance in there. And having these two different characters that kind of either pole of the spectrum of Romulan personalities enabled me to kind of show off the idea that not all Romulans are identical, is that some of them are kind of closer to us, but, you know, they're also alien in their own particular way. Yeah. And, I mean, when you're writing tie-in books, I mean, not just for Star Trek, I know you've done uh, lots of other tie-in novels for different TV shows. I mean, what's what's... What's the appeal to doing that? I mean, is it do you enjoy imagining these extensions of these existing fictional worlds and maybe building up some new canon or or, or new ideas? What's what's the appeal to you? There, that that is a part of it. Um, I often talk about the idea of the toy box, as I say that you know these these fictional worlds that I've enjoyed throughout the years is someone comes to you and here's this box of toys and they say you can take these toys out and you can tell a story with them. Ultimately, though, you have to put them back in the box and you have to give the toys back because they don't belong to you. So you don't have ownership of them. And that's the that's the kind of give and take of it. You know, I, I love Star Trek. It's something that's given me so much joy over the years, so much enjoyment. And when I get the opportunity to tell a story in that universe, I feel like it's my opportunity to give something back, to be able to build a little piece of that Star Trek universe and say, well, you know, here's me contributing to this great tapestry, which, you know, was it just recently they said 800 hours of Star Trek? I think it was yeah. now with, with the end of, with the end of discovery. And that's just the the stuff that's been on screen. You know, if we, if we talk about the games and the comics and the novels and, you know, every other sort of ancillary piece of Star Trek fiction out there, there's, you know, a, a, a colossal amount of material and as somebody who's got a deep abiding love for the franchise, being able to make a little bit of that and put it out there is is really rewarding. And of course, if you're writing about a universe that people know and love like Star Trek, the great thing about it is you immediately get a built in audience. So if I told just a kind of generic sci fi story, you know, it might be difficult for me to get a lot of people to look at that. But if I tell a story about Star Trek, immediately everyone who likes Star Trek is going to give that a look. And it allows me to kind of get access to a wider audience, which is, you know, what every writer really, really loves. Mm. And you alluded earlier to to writing articles and short stories. Is it, I mean, is transitioning between these kind of different mediums of writing easy for you or difficult for you? Do you have to kind of get a different mindset on things and stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like changing gear. You know, I think um, if you're writing a script or a short story or a novel, or a comic book, or, you know, opera, radio play, pop song, whatever, right? It's all writing at the end of the day. It's all about creating a narrative and and telling a story. And and at the very most basic level, it is about creating characters and a situation and plot and, and pushing a narrative forward. But the way you express that, obviously, it plays out in different ways. If you're writing a short story, you know, that's going to have a different energy to it that would come from say writing a movie script or writing a novel because those formats are very very different and i love being able to sort of jump between them to chop and change because i think you need a slightly different set of tools for each type of story that you tell and i think doing different types of story 
helps me stay fresh and stay focused because it gives me uh, a kind of renews me every time I sort of like jump onto a, a different genre. I think if I just wrote the same type of thing, if I just did say nothing but short stories, I think after a while I would get a bit stale and changing it up just kind of enables me to kind of stay engaged. Yeah. Is that the same with your Mark Dane thrillers and then maybe switching to sci-fi, just kind of jumping between these different topics and genres? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, going to writing stories in different worlds, again, gives a different challenge because there's a different set of rules and there's a different set of requirements and, and the audience are looking for different kinds of things. So it, it kind of stretches me as a writer. It makes me change up my skills. I guess it's like if you imagine you're you know, a sportsman, if you're a football player and then someone comes to you and says, well, you know, we want you to play cricket or we want you to run the you know, 500 meters. If you're still a fit guy, right, you can do probably either of those things, but you have to apply yeah. a different set of skills to it in order to do it well. Yeah, definitely. And do you have a, a, a particular process to your writing are you one of these people who who likes to write in the night or or just in the day i need to be way more disciplined really i mean <laughs> i'm always saying that you, you think after years of doing this now that i would have this stuff down pat but i really don't it's i tend to i, I treat it like a day job you know i i, I do a five-day week and I'll, I'll get up in the morning at nine o'clock i'll sit down in front of my computer and i'll write until five o'clock in the evening and i i treat it like my day job because it is my day job so I try to be disciplined and focused. I look at it very much as kind of craft rather than art. I don't kind of write at random different time periods. I don't kind of write in random places. I don't go to coffee shops and do it. I just sit in my office in my house and I write. But that's how I do it. You know, there's uh, the thing about writing and writers is that if you ask 10 different writers how they do it, you get 10 different answers. And every one of those answers is correct for that writer. So, you know, if you want to be a writer, you have to find the thing that works for you. This is what works for me. And that's the the uh, the medium that I embrace. Yeah. Um, and we mentioned earlier your, your Mark Dane thriller series. What what kind of drew you to the to the spy thriller genre after you'd after you'd been kind of in the world of sci-fi? What, what, what kind of drew you to that that concept and that idea? Well, I've always been a fan of, of those kind of thrillers. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm largely a sci-fi guy, but I think my, my sort of second favorite genre is that sort of action adventure, fast paced spy thriller. And I'd been writing a lot of time stuff and doing quite a lot of science fiction for, for several years. And I, I thought I just needed to test myself a little bit. I needed to kind of get out of my comfort zone because I knew I could do sci-fi, but I wasn't really sure if I could do something kind of set in the modern day with a more action thriller sort of tone to it. So I decided, you know what, let's see if I can do this. Let's just push myself a little bit because again you know when i was saying earlier about you know kind of getting getting stale i think i wanted to make sure that wasn't happening to me i wanted to make sure that i keep pushing myself because i think the way that you get better as a writer the way you you know you evolve and you level up is you have to keep challenging yourself to to find new ways to write new stories to tell mm. and i suppose with with the mark dane thriller you're not you're not uh caught in the parameters that you are with a time novel so you, you you're allowed to kind of express yourself a bit more freely is, is that would you say yeah that's right i mean with the with the mark dane stuff um obviously it's set in the present day and it, it you know so it has to have a sort of degree of realism to it so there are there are rules as it were but they're they're my rules so I get to decide what happens to the characters and I get to make the you know the choices. The thing about writing for a tie-in franchise is that you are writing at the pleasure ultimately of somebody else, right? So mm. if if the powers that be at Star Trek say to me, you can't put this in your book because we don't want it in there, then I can't put it in there. And it's as simple as that. And that is the rules. You know, that's that's not something to be kicked against. That's the way it works, right? That's because you're doing a job of work for somebody and you're expected to do that job whereas if i'm writing something myself i get to decide where the lines are and i get to choose what is and is not right for that story yeah has any of your writing with the mark dane thriller series has that has any of that type of writing informed the way you kind of write your star trek novels because the dark veil vale had a, it had a, it kind of had a, a thriller investigative feel to it at certain points there's a lot of that in it was that kind of an intentional kind of leaning towards that i think that yeah i think every time i do a piece of writing i think it kind of folds back into the other pieces of writing you know so if i'm writing say like a, an audio drama story you know that helped me working in video game writing because there's a bit of crossover there and and then writing video game stories helped me write my thriller stories because they're about writing fast-paced propulsive stories that kind of push you through the narrative and that's something that works very well in the thriller world and so coming back from thrillers to write science fiction you know the 
the ability to kind of write a story that has pace to it was definitely something that I pulled into writing uh, The Dark Veil. Mm. Do you do you particularly enjoy writing for one genre than the other? I mean, you said that sci-fi was p- pretty embedded in you anyway, but writing thriller series or, or, or writing script work or anything like that? I guess, you know, I'm just happy to be writing, really. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky that I get to do what I love for a living, and I really do love writing. It's, you know, some days it's hard. Uh, some days it feels like kind of grinding down a piece of granite with your teeth, you know. But it's, but I've done, you know, I've done real day jobs in the real world where I've had to do real hard work, and I, and I am lucky, and I think I'm lucky every day that I get to sit down and make stuff up for a living. So um, I'm just happy to, to be telling stories. I love telling science fiction stories because you have such a, a fantastic breadth of ideas and concepts that, where you can just go out into the wild and just come up with amazing stuff but i like also writing kind of contemporary stories because it feels like i can kind of reflect the events of the world that are going on around me and i can tell stories about characters that feel more embedded in the present day that are closer to the you know your real experience yeah definitely i suppose it gives you a different a different mindset on things as well yeah very much so it's kind of like you know i have to put a different hat on when i'm sitting down to write you know okay i'm gonna wear my thriller hat today and i'm gonna write this but i find i can't sort of chop and change like you know i wouldn't do like a thriller story in the morning and then have lunch and then go off and write a Star Trek story in the yeah. afternoon. I can't change gears as easily as that. For me, I, I'll sit down and uh, write. It's okay, I'm going to write a Star Trek novel. And then, like that is the project I'm going to be working on for the next couple of months. And that is all I will do. And then when that's done, I put that aside. I take a little break and go, okay, now I'm going to do this different thing. And I change gears and I start working like that. And was there, I mean, are, are there any uh, authors or sci-fi authors in particular or any other authors that you have really kind of... Uh, looked up to in, in, in your career that's, that's informed your writing in any way oh yeah very much so i mean if we're talking about mainstream science fiction authors is uh top of that list has to be william gibson yeah uh the cyberpunk author i, I remember reading his stuff in the 1980s and just absolutely blown away by the the sort of strength of voice that he has is he's got this incredible sort of hyper nuanced detail and just it was just incredible. It's the kind of thing now where if I'll pick that book off the shelf and I'll kind of thumb through it, I find I'm, you know, an hour later, I'm still reading it because I'm just drawn into the, into the style of writing. I was also a big fan of, of the works of uh, Philip K. Dick, who's the guy, of course, who came up with the, the story that Blade Runner was based yeah. on um, because his stuff is just incredible, crazy out there kind of science fiction ideas, um, which just, uh, you know, I find sort of endlessly fascinating. Um, I think probably those those two guys would be the the, the ones I, I grew up reading and wanting to emulate. Yeah, Blade Runner is kind of in the blueprint for a lot of of, of sci fi films and books over the years. It's it's it's, it's really informed a lot of of writers and filmmakers. Very much so. Yeah. So, um, what what other Star Trek project? If you can if you can if you can say if it's hush hush, you can tell me to uh, to stop. But is is there any more Star Trek projects for you that that in the future that are coming up? Um, there is a Star Trek project that I'm working on, um, and that's all I can say about that. <laughs> that's, that's no problem. And what other projects have you got in the pipeline that you, that you can maybe tell us about that I read it, that our, our, our listeners will be interested in? Well, um, I've just, before the end of the year, I've finished what will be the uh, sixth Mark Dane novel, um, and that is currently going through edits, and that will hopefully be coming out later this year. But before that happens, the, the fifth book uh, in the series, Rogue, that will be coming out uh, in paperback, I think, in the summer. Uh, and beyond that, um, I've got a couple of other projects that uh, haven't been announced yet, so I can't say much more about them. Uh, and I also, at the end of the year, I also worked on a novel uh, with my colleague, uh, Josh Reynolds, based on the video game Watch Dogs Legion called Day Zero, uh, and that has done very well, and people have really, uh, really been enjoying that. And that was a lot of fun to work on. Cool, excellent. Um, and for uh, my last kind of official question, if you were stranded on a desert island, which three sci-fi books, or just books, you can include non non sci-fi in there if you'd like, but what sci-fi or normal books would you want to take with you? You have a choice of three. Wow. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So the first one I would take would be the worst case scenario survival handbook. Good choice. Which, which is which is a really useful book. It tells you like a lot of really really cool stuff. What to do, you know, if you get bitten by sort of snakes or if you're in a shipwreck, that kind of thing. So that would probably be just purely for to, to survive <laughs> while I was while I was on the desert island. Um, 
The other two, see, I'm a very fast reader, so what I want to do is kind of cheat and say like the collective works of William Shakespeare because it would like give me give me plenty to read, right? Um, but sure. to be honest, I think I would probably pick stuff. I probably pick uh, a couple of books that I really like. I would I would probably say. I'd, I'd pick Neuromancer by William Gibson because I love that book. I could, I could reread that over and over again. And I'd cheat and say The Complete Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because that's another one of my favorite books. Yeah. That whole series. And because it's funny, that would definitely keep my spirits up. Yeah. I'm sure you can, you know, have that as one book anyway. So I think you'd be all right with that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've got some listeners' questions. We've got one from Craig, who who is one of our uh, podcasters on the network. He asks, what is your experience with the Titan novels or the TNG relaunch novels? Have you read them? And was there anything you wanted to include from them in your book? Um, not only have I read them, I've written a few of them. Uh, oh. I I wrote, let me see, was it three or is it four? I have, to, I have to count back down and figure out how many I've actually written. I, I worked on uh, a couple of novels in, in the Titan series. Uh, my first one was Synthesis, uh, and then I did uh, Sight Unseen most recently, and I also wrote the Titan novel for the Fall miniseries, The Poison Chalice, all of which were Titan novels, all about sort of like Riker and Troy uh, on the on the Titan and getting into crazy wacky adventures there. So yeah, I've definitely uh, been reading those books and, and sort of keeping up with them. In terms of uh, bringing stuff across for um, the Dark Vale that was a kind of a difficult line to walk because the, the novels uh, exist in kind of their own continuity because those books were, you know, we started writing those books when there was no possibility that there was going to be another series set post nemesis, you know, when it looked like the only stories we were going to get were going to be sort of like the Kelvin timeline plots. So uh, we had a pretty free hand there to kind of build up stories that took place after the end of Voyager and after the end of DS9, and after the end of, of, of Star Trek Nemesis. But now um, things have changed with the shows moving forward. And now we have like Lower Decks and we have Picard and we'll have like, you know, more shows going on past that point as well that are all taking place in that time period. That novel continuity is kind of branched off into its own sort of parallel timeline. So um, we have to be careful about bringing stuff across because of course, if you, anything you bring across can be now contradicted by a future episode of the TV mm. show. So it's a difficult line to walk. You don't want to say like, you know, oh, this character is seen doing this thing and we're introducing this particular thing. And then the next week, an episode of the show comes out, which completely invalidates absolutely everything <laughs> you said. Yeah, it must be hard tiptoeing around what is what is now new continuity and what isn't continuity anymore. Very much so. Luckily, we, with these books, we are getting, as I said, working with uh, with Kirsten, we do have we do have a kind of conduit to the production. So we, there is a little bit of back and forth going on. It's much better than it used to be. Yeah. Um, that kind of links into what you just said and what we alluded to earlier uh, for the next question by Tony Black, who, who was our network uh, manager. He uh, he asks, um, I'd like to know how much or how little you consulted with the writers of Picard, the show, and how much crossover there was. Well, I think pretty much answered that one right there. Yeah, I had... Um... I got access to to the scripts and sort of production notes and stuff. So while the show was being made, I was getting to see the the episodic scripts and and, and material as the show was being developed. So we could factor all of that in, and so I knew what what directions the characters were going to take and and what um what stuff I could and couldn't use. You know, what stuff was just like on on the table and, and there for me to employ in the story, and what stuff was like you know leave that to one side because that's something we might explore uh, in a future episode. Cool. Ian Buckley, uh, he asks, what is your favourite kind of Trek story to write? I suppose that means whether it's action or it's in investigation or something like that. Oh, that's a really good question. Wow. Um, I, you know, I, I think about the things in Star Trek that always appeal to me. Is I, I love the the core tenet of the idea is that I, I've always felt that Star Trek is, a, is the, one of the main things that Star Trek says is if we work together, we can we can achieve great things. So I love stories that kind of come back to that stories that will challenge our preconceptions and, uh, and will sort of say, ask us to kind of look past the surface. But I also love Star Trek stories that have a sense of wonder to them where, you know, we see something incredible and new and we we're challenged by, um, by what we see. And then again, I, I love stories where there's a bit of pew pew going on as well. So uh, <laughs> stuff where there's a, where there's a space battle, you know, I always love to see cool starships doing cool stuff. 
So I think anything I do would be a kind of merging of, of all of those elements. Cool. Good answer. Um, Steve asks, uh, did you watch Discovery season three and did you enjoy it? I did and I did. Yeah, it was uh, <laughs> we, we, we literally we just like only like a, what, a week ago, we just finished the final episode there. Um, I I, th- I thought it was really interesting to see the way the the show feels like it's kind of grown into its shoes, definitely in uh, in season three, and they they took some interesting directions. You know, stuff happened there I, I was I wasn't expecting, um, and some I, I feel like the characters are, re- are really kind of ringing true in the, in this new environment, and they they've just they've just took it in a direction I really wasn't expecting, especially with the the you know the the whole time jump thing. Just to get into spoilers here a little bit. Um, so often in Star Trek, we've seen people who are kind of displaced in time. And it's always been people from the past brought into the kind of the Star Trek present. And they're dealing with kind of like, well, I was in the past, but now I'm in this future. I don't understand. But we've never seen it go the other way around. We've never seen characters thrust into the future and having to deal with being sort of time out of joint. And I really love that idea of taking the Discovery crew and putting them in this place where they don't know what's going on, where they're trying to hold on to the values they have and they're trying to navigate this new world that they don't quite understand. And that for me was like one of the most compelling things about season three of Disco. Yeah. How did you think they kind of handled the future tech in the third season? Because I know that, you know, throwing them out of time has has allowed a lot more freedom uh, in design and character growth and all that stuff. But I was just wondering what, what your thought was, you know, how they've kind of aesthetically shown the new tech 900 years in the future yeah the thing like kind of like like the you know the disconnected warp day cells and that sort of thing is that those are all very kind of subtle things i like the the sort of the the com badge as tricorder thing with a little holographic on like that that mm. makes perfect sense is that you would have technology like that you know and the personal transporter the like you know the phaser that's like a bracelet that sort of phases it morphs into your hand and then back out again when you're not using it all of those sort of things those little sort of technical widgets and what have you i think yeah that makes a that makes a lot of sense yeah. Um, um, some of the ship designs, I think they're, they're they're pretty crazy. They're pretty out there. Um, but then that makes sense, right? I mean, it's three hundred years into the future, so the the ship tech would look different, and you don't know what kind of unusual alien influences they've been over those so that those centuries to sort of change the way that that Starfleet looks. So yeah, I'm 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 really interested in seeing what other other stuff they do. I think there's a lot of opportunity there to bring other elements in. I'd love to see, you know, um. Uh, a ship full of holographic people or a, a, a ship that's crewed by artificial intelligences or, or other alien species that, you know, we've only seen sort of in the background of, of previous Star Trek episodes, just, you know, let's have a captain of a starship. Who's kind of like an intelligent cloud of gas or something mm-hmm. like that. Right. We could go completely crazy with it. I'd love to see that sort of thing. Yeah. And kind of link into that. What, what's your, what's your hopes and kind of theories about what um, Star Trek Picard season two might be going if if you're not privy to information i can't really i you know i can't really <laughs> answer that question because i've you know i've i've been told some things yeah so i can't really i can't really say i mean i think in a broad sense um i'm interested to see how the this kind of dysfunctional crew that we've had come together will sort of find find their rhythm it's like where do they go now what do they do next what's the next challenge that these characters have in front of them because one thing that's interesting about Picard is that because we've gone outside the sort of the realm of Starfleet, kind of all bets are off. Really, is mm. that we can tell any kind of story we want. We don't have to be bound by the sort of the the questions and issues that you would have with a Starfleet crew doing Starfleet stuff, following Starfleet rules. We don't have to. We don't have to adhere to any of that. We just have to adhere to the kind of the core tenet of going out and helping people. But there's a lot of ways you can do that. So I think the exploration of that is going to be very interesting. Yeah, I think as long as you stick within the thematic core of Star Trek, which isn't necessarily, as you said, within Starfleet, I, I think you can, you can you can go so many places. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the last question is from Mike Slammer. He says, outside of Star Trek, what is your current favourite science fiction series? Now, he doesn't specify book or TV, so I'll leave that to your discretion. Oh, that's a good question, too. Um, well, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, The Mandalorian. That was, um, I mean, as a, you know, I'm, I love Star Wars because I'm, I'm a child of the Star Wars generation. And I didn't really know what to expect with that. Uh, but it's just been 
it's just been really fun. I mean, I know a lot of people have said, oh, it's kind of just fan service and it's just full of sort of like stuff just to sort of make nostalgia stuff to make Star Wars nerds happy. But you know what? That's I'm fine with that. Mm. I am absolutely fine with that. I mean, I, I, I like the sort of texture of it and I love the, the kind of the, the sort of like the homages to like, you know, Westerns and samurai movies. And uh, it's just uh, it's just a lot of fun. You know, the fact that they haven't kind of kept to a consistent length of episode they felt like the, the stories are as long as they need to be. Um, so I, I just, uh, yeah, I just really like that. And I'm looking forward to the next season of that show. Yeah, definitely. It's been excellent. Um, and the last question is actually for me, if, if you'll indulge you f- uh, for a moment, I'm, I, I'm currently kind of planning on writing a, a, a short story, my first short story. And wondering if you can give me any kind, any kind of tips and pointers on, on like, how to structure it and and what I should be aiming for in a, in a, in a short story. I've got the, like the general um, timeline and, and, and narrative. It's just, I, I know for short stories, you need to kind of stick to a certain kind of um, structure as it were. Well, I, I guess if, you know, if you, if you're, if you're just doing it for yourself, you know, it's not like you're doing it for like a deadline or for somebody who's expecting you to write, like it has to be 10,000 words long and I have to have it by next Tuesday. Right. Mm. If, if you're, if you're doing it for yourself, then the great thing is, is, is that you, you don't have the pressure there to worry about. You can take as long over as you need to. I would say if you've got a good structure, that's the most important. I mean, I'm a, I'm a plotter guy. You know, they talk about plotters and pantsers. Do you do, do you do it by a plot or do you do it by the seat of your pants? And I'm very much a plot guy. You know, yeah. I, what I do is I put together my plot first and then I say, okay, this is what I want it to be about. This is places and locations and events in the story. And then I look at the characters I have and I say, okay, how do the characters reflect off of that plot? And how does one thing influence the other? And then combining those two streams gives me the structure for what the the story will be in, in whatever format it plays out in. So I would say, um, if you can, find a find a part of your day, find a part of your week where you can just dedicate yourself, even if it's just an hour a week somewhere on, you know, get up early on Sunday morning and just spend a little bit of time, but sit down, ring fence that time off and be very, very sort of rigid about it. You know, this is my writing time. Just sit down and just do it. Mm. You know, there's, is, there's a, the, the famous writer, Brian Clemens, one of the guys who was the, the creators of the Avengers. He's a great quote. He said, he said, ass in chair, hands on keyboard. There's no secret to it. Excellent. And I've, I've always, I've always held true to that. And I was like, bless you, man. That's a, that's a brilliant way of putting it. Because if you just sit down, you put one word in front of another. If you write like a thousand words a week, at the end of the year, you've got a novel. Yeah. And that's all it is. It's just one word in front of another. So just make that time in your schedule and just sit there and work through it. And the other important thing to do is I say to every writer, every new writer I speak to is finish it. Mm. Often people will say, well, I got halfway through this story and I didn't really like it. So I, I put it aside and I went off and I wrote half of another story and half of another story. And I, I go back to that analogy. I said at the beginning about, you know, working at it as a, like, as if you were like a, a plumber or a baker or a doctor, right? It's like, people talk about writer's block and I say, there's no such thing as writer's block. It's just, you're, you just, you're not doing it right. Mm. There's something, you know, your story, if your story, if you feel blocked, it's because you haven't plotted it out properly. Go back to your plot and look at it and say, why is this not moving forward? Why is it, why is it fighting me? And look for the thing that, you know, you've made a mistake somewhere, go back and find the mistake that you made just in the same way that like, you know, if you were a plumber, plumbers don't get plumbers block, right? Plumbers don't wake up in the morning and go, Oh, I can't, oh, I'm just not feeling it. I don't want to plumb that sink in, you know, in just the same way that a baker doesn't say, Oh, well, you know, I got halfway through baking this cake and I didn't like it. So I just kind of left it. Nobody wants a half baked cake. Nobody wants an unplumbed sink. Nobody wants half of a story. You have to finish what you start because even if you get to the end of the story that you're written and you look at it and you go, you know what? I could have done that better. That's a good thing because it means you've become a better writer. Because if you look at that story and you say, I can think of a way to improve that, that means that your critical ability of your own work has also improved. And the next thing you write will be better. Excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you very much for joining me today. So if you'd like to tell our lovely listeners where people can find you on the internet and, and on the social media. Well, best place to find me on a regular basis is on my Twitter feed, which is at JM Swallow. Uh, there I pretty much post about most of the stuff going on in my life, all the new books I've got coming out, occasionally interesting pictures of things, and just generally hang out. If you want to learn more about me and my writing and just keep up to date with what I've got coming out, come visit me at my website at jswallow.com. That's pretty much your one-stop shop for everything I've done. So all of my work is up there, my Mark Dane stuff, my Star Trek books, links up there to all of my work. 
um, where you can pick up copies of it if you want to. And there's also um, downloadable sort of clips and, and bits of chapters. And there's also a, a free Mark Dane novella up there as well. If you want to download that and read that on your electronic device, you can, you can pick it up right there. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you today, uh, James. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Luke. It's always good to, to chat about stuff. I always say I, I love talking about writing. I can just gas about how much, you know, how great my job is all, all day long. And uh, especially combining that with talking about Star Trek too, is, yeah. that's uh, no trouble at all for me. I love it. Excellent. So James Swallow's new book, The Dark Veil, vale, is out now on all your online bookstores. Uh, I'm only saying online because I think they're the only ones open at the minute. But, but it's out now. It's a fantastic addition to the Star Trek Picard story and to the Star Trek universe as a whole. Uh, that just leaves me to ask the helmsman to uh, plot our course and we'll see you next time. Engage. Elsewhere on We Made This. Cerebral Jukebox. I think as I've got older, I don't care what people think of my music taste anymore. I'm happy to admit that, like, I really missed the boat because, like, in the 2000s, I was really angsty teen and I was up road from Lincoln Park on, a, on the daily. And I'd be ashamed to admit that I kind of like Savage Garden and Craig yeah. David and I had this very strange diet. But now I go back and listen to all these, like, 2000s UK garage tracks and they were absolutely astounding. Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast. Maybe I'm not coming at it from a an educated point of view because, you know, not only am I a man, I'm gay. You know, I, I don't deal with pregnancy. Are you? And, um... I, 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 have you ever told us that before? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to make a serious point. Hey, we love you, you know that. Yeah, but yeah, you've you got a good point, Colin. This is a bit of a sausage fest episode. We, maybe we should have got a lady involved. The Movie Palace. This is a film you'd seen before, before we decided to discuss these two. Is that right? This was a rewatch for you. No, this was a first time oh. viewing. <laughs> Bells of St. Mary's, I watched for the first time last Christmas and really enjoyed it. And I had heard um, many things about the first one, especially how it had, you know, swept at the Oscars, but I had never watched it. So when, when we started to discuss, you know, a film to, to talk about for the holidays, I thought this is a great excuse to watch the first one. <laughs> Check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This Podcast Network. Make It So, a Star Trek Universe podcast, was created and is produced and hosted by Tony Black and Kurt North. You can find the show on Twitter at Jean-Luc Poddard and on Facebook in the Make It So, a Star Trek podcast fan group discussion group. Check out the We Made This Network at We Made This Pod on Twitter and on Facebook by typing in We Made This and you can find all of our shows on our website, WeMadeThisPod.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>